And there's fascinating evidence from the neuropsychological literature that when people are relying only on the left hemisphere, their world becomes fragmented. Their vision of the world is of bits that don't really connect with one another. And Louis Sass has written brilliantly, I think, about the way in which this fragmentation, which is so characteristic a part of modern thought, is comparable to the mind of the schizophrenic. And he draws a lot of subtle and brilliant parallels. It seems to me that one could do a kind of parallel study of modernism and phenomena in psychopathology, and that each could, in a way, illuminate the other. And the, the thing that I think these two phenomena really have in common is a kind of exaggerated uh, self-consciousness that involves all kinds of paradoxes. One of which is that it's a, a certain kinds of self-consciousness actually result in the, the fragmentation or, or the dissolving of the self. And I think one of the useful things about a phenomenon like schizophrenia is that it makes you realize that there, there actually is a real phenomenon there, and we realize that when we see its absence. The traditional view of what happens to the self in schizophrenia is that a loss of rationality leaves the self prey to the irrational. Sass, however, who has spent his professional life studying and treating schizophrenia sufferers like Peter Arakawa, argues that the exact opposite is true, that the self in schizophrenia is destroyed by its own self-scrutinizing rationality. Too much, undiluted, left hemisphere activity. If you want to try to sum up what schizophrenia is really all about, the, the really prominent features are captured by the terms hyperreflexivity and alienation. Hyperreflexivity, by that I mean a kind of self-consciousness. I don't just mean the self-consciousness of a, say, um, an adolescent, but rather it, it, it's, it's the schizophrenic self-consciousness is something much more disruptive of the normal spontaneous uh, flow of, of experience and of behavior. And it can also happen intellectually so that one becomes sort of aware of one's own thinking. You know, his, his term of self-reflexivity, I think, is, is very appropriate. I mean, there, there is a, a very intensive sense of self-consciousness. Self My mind would be constantly, be constantly thinking, and um, it would be a way of um, sort of um, as it using the brush to get that stuff that's inside outside. They can get very engaged in a uh, process of watching their own mind, and um, they will sometimes almost feel that they're um, they can kind of see the the cognitive operations going on inside their skull, uh, or they may just sort of think about thinking, and they may begin to analyze themselves too much. It could be extremely uh, debilitating and uh, alienating for the person. This was like reading a book, a hard book, and your mind starts to burn and you can't put it down. Yeah, that's what it's like. So a scrutinizing self-consciousness that is not relaxed and able to just accept itself ends up leading to an experience of there being no self. For Sass, the schizophrenic world is where the rationality of the interpreter of the left hemisphere has unpicked the self and run out of control. The question is, is that our world, too? In schizophrenia, the left hemisphere is doing most of the processing of information. 
the left hemisphere tends to see a thing as bits of things that don't necessarily cohere at all and is most at home actually with things that present themselves as rather novel lumps of little bits and so one gets a sort of world which is alien which the more one looks at it the more bizarre it seems from which one feels distinct which appears mechanical functional but also rather frightening in the case of the schizophrenic. And these feelings of alienation, these feelings of um, a sort of existential angst that there is no real meaning to anything, it also seems to be a key aspect of both modernism and postmodernism. I call the painting uh, The Judgment. I suppose the figure is myself, is protection. Patients with schizophrenia sometimes describe themselves as mechanisms and they can't relate parts of their experience. I mean, that is, that is something that happens to all of us. Well, tell me about this one. Well, my idea was that we have uh, space and time, uh, uh, sort of concepts that are structured in the mind. The brain is a clock. But I think that there was a coherent self that has become increasingly unraveled or increasingly unsustainable. And I think that's to do with the way in which modern culture fragments and alienates and is similar to the world view of the schizophrenic. And I think that one can cease to be in touch with whatever it is that, that helps one with that sense of coherence, and that increasingly we do find that life is fragmented. And I think it, it then becomes easier to think of all one's experiences and things that happen to one as this immense heap of little things, and where the self is in it, who one identifies there, what one identifies, um, is, is a difficult concept. Did I have a strong sense of self when I was schizophrenic? Um, it was different because there was much more going on in my brain. I would go to sleep simply to turn off my brain. Um, what was going on in there? <laughs> Everything possible. <laughs> um, let's see. Um, and where were you in the midst of this? Um, I was a witness. I was a witness to it all. It was a frightening place to get to in the search for whatever it is inside us that makes us feel like individuals. Along with the freedom that individualism gives is also the vulnerability that comes with it. Now, I would argue that these two aspects are closely related to the two directions in which this particular kind of modern self-consciousness about the mind can develop. On the one hand, we can feel that our mind is all-powerful and in a way is the godlike source of everything. But on the other hand, we also make our mind into an object of attention. And by doing that, we make it just another thing among things, potentially just a mechanism. And so the modern sense of self can therefore veer back and forth between this incredible grandiosity and this incredible feeling of utter impotence. And that's the kind of problematizing of the self that um, we see both in madness and in modernism. So this is what has become of the liberated self that Shakespeare uncovered. A narrative, yes, but free-floating, cut adrift, without any author to anchor it in place. A postmodern, anxious self. Interesting what happens in postmodernism is that we feel as though there is no way of breaking out of the world that we have constructed, this, this scheme, as it were. We are aware that we have set up a scheme, and we say the scheme is everything. And so we're reduced to going round like a mouse in a treadmill around these same concepts, limited by what the left brain is offering us. 
And that is the price we pay for believing too strongly in the model of the left brain. But that model of a rational, utilitarian, left brain world, which we have lived with for the last 300 years, is changing. The gap between what we have always felt ourselves to be and what science has insisted we are is closing. <laughs>